Uh, we got the call, and the person who received the call, the reporter who received the call, uh, said the, the person on the line is Njonjo, uh, and the first question is asked is, can I speak to somebody who can speak English? You look at him, you wonder what kind of uh, perfume does he use after shave? He's so clean and sparkling, no matter what people thought about him, whether he's a good man or a bad man, they knew one thing about him, consistency. He never changed. He never backtracked on what he believed was right on his own way. I am Kirkwai Chitanui, head of news at KTN. But I think even more important and in the relevance of the di uh, discussion we are going to have on Jonjo is that I'm one of, uh, one of those experienced journalists uh, who have read, interacted with them, but I can't say I belong to the generation that uh, was there when they were covering the Jonjo in Buhari. I came in later and uh, by the time I was in the newsroom, Jonjo was in uh, what you call the political wilderness and I think consigned to private life. So I will not give so much an account uh, of his life at that time, but I will tell you what I, I learned about him as a consumer of news uh, in college and right up to the beginning of my journalism at the Nation Media Group. Yes, uh, I've read very, uh, I would say, uh, in, the, in the language that we use now, we would say factual. Uh, meeting and then physical meeting was only twice. You see, Jonjo belonged to a generation and a cadre of politicians that looked inaccessible. They li seemed to li we, li we share this world together, but they seemed to share different tests of life, different uh, uh, lands completely. So I got in the newsroom and was being told about this Jonjo. I had heard about him in the, inqu uh, the inquiry. He came out as a master of both contradiction and deceit in the commission, and that's what when he was put through the judicial commission. That on the one hand, he would assist President Moy to succeed Kenyatta. On the other, he would be planning all along, and those are claims, all along, to, 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 uh, this was part of his plan to succeed him. So, you see, he looked for us a very intriguing fellow, that he can be very deceptive. That's what we knew about him, that he's a guy who also lived in a different planet. The only thing we were sharing is one world, unfortunately. And so in the inquiry, we were told about someone whose water and fruits came from France, somebody who had a, a, a retinue of chefs at home, and when it was time to eat, they would ring the bell like it is in a Victorian family in the UK of the classical era. Uh, you go there, you have to have all the mannerisms of the English on the table. You feel a bit overwhelmed when you imagine you're going to see him that he'll be listening to your diction, uh, how you pronounce words, he would look at how you dress. And so when I joined the nation, I used to be told about stories that, of people who, they were, who were thrown out by John when they, they went to see him, despite being invited. You either go, you know that time, journalists used to, to dress in jeans and uh, uh, half jackets, you know, and the, 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 the photographers. So an amused John would just say, you know, I can't talk with you. Or if your language, completely is broken. He gets embarrassed and says, you can't talk to me. That's the, that's the legend we knew about. And that's as far as I knew him before the actual meeting. The, the, f the first experience I had uh, with Njonjo was that President Moy had a function in uh, uh, Laikipia. And in the course, there had been tribal clashes. And in the course of that meeting, uh, some Kantakara's politician made a, a claim that they were, tribal, they were tribal warriors being trained and they were based at the ranch owned by Njonjo in Laikibyo. Njonjo and another millionaire at that time, I think you remember, Atnan Kashoki, who featured as an arms dealer in the Njonjo inquiry. So I came and did my story and uh, I made the silly mistake that young journalists do of, uh, and given the technology of that time, of not counter-checking whether it is really owned by Njonjo. And so the next day, I had a lot of problems in the office because Njonjo was on the line, and he really was furious, asking who is Tanui, where was he, who told him that. Then eventually he put in a line that shocked me and that defined the way I think Njonjo viewed journalism. 
he told our news editor, I think Caleb at me that time, or Joe Kithinji, that I'm not going to throw my good money into chasing bad money. And so it, 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 it really dis shocked us because he was, we knew that when people complain, they are going to sue, but not Jonjo. He just said, he just left it to our conscience. And so I kept, kept, kept wondering who is this Jonjo. Then one day it so happened, uh, Jonjo was uh, at that time a philanthropist uh, associated with the Staria Boy Center. So I was sent to cover him and uh, we went and I remember we were only two. And after the presentation, presentation of check to the principal, we got, because he had, been, he had never been in public life and I had been tasked with one question, is Njonjo returning to public life? into politics. So after exchanging pleasantries, he wanted to leave, I asked him the question. He asked us whether we had any questions, so I asked him. Remember, I told you we were very shy. You didn't even know how to initiate a question. What? In terms of given what we knew about him, what had been fed on us. So he asked one question. Who? Me? Going back to politics? Politics is a very dirty game. As, an, as a young cab reporter at that time, I knew I have the headline for a John story, and I was very happy. So the rest went smoothly, and I left in Georgia. We, we parted with that respect. We didn't ask no, any more questions. You know, it was, as, a, as, as, I, as I told you, we were a bit uh, shy when it comes to him. It was my first encounter. I went and did my story, and it appeared on the journal of nation. What I do not know, and I think the editors at the, uh, at the initial, this music desk level didn't know, is that it seems there was an agreement between, uh, at a very high level in media news, to give Njonja a blackout. So this story was used. The next day, uh, I was being asked by some members of the board to appear and explain how I was assigned the story. How, who, 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 how, who, what did you ask Njonja? Who asked you to ask him? So it really demitated me. But it was there in the streets and the paper was out there. So that is the second experience I had with Njonji uh, in terms of my work. As I said, it is one physical and one virtual. Uh, many years later, uh, Njonji had, uh, uh, of course, maintained that silence. So many years later, as uh, I had left and joined the Standard, while in the newsroom, uh, we got a call. And the person who received the call, the reporter who received the call, uh, said the, the person on the line is uh, Njonji. And the first question is asked is, can I speak to somebody who can speak English? And it looked hard because this is an English newspaper produced by Kalenjins, lawyers, and he knows. But when he says, he calls the newsroom and asks for an English, somebody who speaks English, uh, in the newsroom it's interpreted to mean this person can only deal with the higher uh, somebody at a higher level. So I was called in to take his call. Not that they couldn't speak English, but you know, of course, English meant the actual diction, the actual pronunciation, the way uh, the English people do. So I came and he, I, exp I explained who I was, and then he asked me uh, the same question. Do you speak English? I said yes. Very well, I said yes. So he asked me, why do we keep using, the, he complained about two things. and. One, that we keep referring to uh, Mzemoy as former president. He said in the US, there are President Carter, President George Bush Jr., Pre President George Bush Sr., and Clinton. They are all retired and they are called presidents. And he said, that is an honor you cut and live with forever. You can only be a retired president or a serving president. And your English is embarrassing you people. And he said he wanted to make it clear. And imagine he has taken his time to look for us in his retirement, in his silence. But this has really piqued him, really hurt him to the extent of calling. Then the next thing he asked was uh, that in Kenyan media, media houses, we keep referring uh, to people who have embarrassing cases, shameful cases in court as Mr. A title that is an honor. He said, in right English tradition, when you have committed a crime and you are in court, you lose that respect or honor, um, a reverence of honor until you are cleared. So you cannot call somebody facing sexual harassment, Mr. 
and anyway, or anybody corruption, theft, and <laughs> what really I should have asked him then is if it is a woman, what do you do? But I was, as I told you again, this is in John on the line. You do not, <laughs> he doesn't call many people, and this is landline. Uh, then we went on, we went on. Uh, I was a columnist in Standard. Then one day I got a call from Jonjo and he called the office and luckily I was there because I was, a, 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 was a, 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 an editor and he asked for me by, pa, by name. So I go there, I go pick the phone. Uh, strangely at that time we were in the digital era but he's not using, uh, he's not calling me on landline. He was somebody who operated in the, what you'd call analog technology where you book a call and it comes to you. So he asked me, he, how, are, how are you? And you know, you have, to try, you have to understand the phraseology and fine, thank you, you know, that kind of language. You know, they just say fine, the way we do this, this. <laughs> so I was very alert. So he asked me to, if we could meet because there's a big story he wanted to share with me. Uh, I said, sir, at your pleasure. So he said, were well, you available tomorrow at 2.30 uh, p.m.? I said, Suddenly, I would. You cannot imagine what it meant having a date with Njonjo. That he has called me himself and I'll be with him alone. And I, I deluded myself at first. I said, whoever, because he did not tell me who referred him to him. I talked about me to him. I said, this must be the story that Kenyans will remember me for. So, I was very excited. I slept very scarcely that day, that night. I was like that child that, you s that is going on a tour to Nairobi for the first time from the village. And you are told about KICC. You are excited, it's like you might have a sleep. And when you, you wake up, people are gone. So when I came to the office in the morning, I said, I have nothing else I'm doing today is in Jonjo's day. In fact, my colleagues were going to visit. I'm going to bring a very tough story. So, <laughs> uh, by around 11, the meeting was too that I was around Westlands. At around uh, one, I was parked outside somewhere along, because his, his office was at the CFC building. He, he's a shareholder in the bank, or Musiamil. So I was on, uh, on the roadside. It was hot, but I just wanted to make sure that I'll be in. 30 minutes to the time I was at the parking, being t and the, he, had, I had, he had given out my name. Uh, I sat in the car, I didn't want to, I felt like I was sweaty and I put on the AC. It was a very old rickety car, but uh, somehow it worked and I, it cooled. Then I went to the, at, the, at 15 minutes, I go to the office of the secretary. First thing that surprised me is that the office is not as, this doesn't show the, George, the opulence that George is associated with. Um, and the secretary was a black woman. We always told Jonjo, only worked with petite white ladies. In fact, in the inquiry, they talked about the lady called, I think, Penelope, if I remember. So I asked the lady, I, here I am. I said, yeah, the chairman, they called it the chairman, is uh, expecting me. So I said, but give him about five minutes, then you get in. So at around five minutes to the time, uh, and I think the secretary had informed him I'm here. He called me, then pressed a button. And uh, that button is to alert him that he's going to open the door. She's going to open the door. So here I walk in, and uh, I, would, I would call it walking into the lion's den. You know, what you have in the mind, <laughs> here you are with him alone. Very conscious of your tongue, very conscious of how you look, very conscious about how you represent yourself, how will you greet him. You remember all the etiquette you were told in school about uh, when you meet people of, uh, who are senior to you. Don't speak until you are spoken to. Don't sit until you are told to sit. It, ca it becomes real in life. And I think at that time I had met people like, uh, I mean, people like Raila Mishuki, I had never had the same feeling of inadequacy, sort of fear, because we, this is a man that no matter what people thought about him, whether he's a good man or a bad man, the new one thing about him, consistency. He never changed. He never backtracked on what he believed was right. So in his own way, he had no apology. So we sit, and he asked me to sit. So the first thing he, asked, he, he, he did 
again, he began that story of the retired, where, where the, because in the collective industry, we, used to, we, we thought it was nice to call more retired president. He again asked and made sure that I understand there's a distinction between retired and former. Retired means you lose the title. And I don't know, I, uh, we leave it to Kenyans and uh, expert language experts to, 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 to educate us on that. So here I sit. Uh, he asked about the media industry in general, very relaxed. In his own, that I, you see, when you meet Njonjo and you have, the, uh, you have memories of what came out in the inquiry, you are very observant and baffled at the same time. So you look at his suit, you want to know, is it true that you can see the letter N in the weaving of the thread of his suit, or you need a magnifying class? Because that's what they said about him, that he not only ordered a suit designed for him, but the material was designed for him, and even the way the threads were configured had to reflect what he wanted. I don't think there's any politician I've ever had in the world who did that where the factory is stopped so that the machine is configured to give you le your, the letters of your name within all the strips. I know people these days go with, get, get the names uh, emplacent on the calves, on part of the collar, but this is who the, ma the whole material is made for him, eh? abroad. You look at him, you wonder what kind of uh, perfume does he use after shave? He's so clean and sparkling, you are sh mesmerized. You look at his watch, you look at the chain that you see. I think John Joe, ha he had a wristwatch, but I think it was more of an ornament. Something that you do because it is the, it is, it's part of your clothing. But whatever you wanted to look at the, to tell the time, you had this dunkling uh, old Victorian watch that is in sort of an enclosure an iron for a golden chain down his neck and he would pull from the patterns of his jacket and he was also of course three piece so i took note of the guy one thing that surprised me is i have never seen this man in any other type of clothing this is how he is you meet him january to december that is how he is maybe when he's in his house and he's put on maybe pajamas or something but not in public life uh, of course in retirement the more Closest he came to broken suit was a great trosser and uh, the, uh, the gentleman's jacket from the UK again. Not that when he didn't have the suit. Nothing else. In old age, of course, you could see him with a sweat. So here he sits. I am in this lion's den. I go by the motions that he, he sets. So the first thing that, in his simplicity, at that time that surprised me, he gave me, he produced some brochures of the CFC Bank. At that time, CFC Bank, was starting uh, uh, the, um, uh, the business of credit cards. So he asked me to look to take them, look at them. If I need a credit card, I, which is very exotic to us, I don't think it, it, uh, a credit card that time looked like, <laughs> you know, I have never had one. I just used to see people swiping and, they, and it used to look like free and it looks to be opulence, you are rich. So I took it. I'm waiting for my moment. Remember, inside my coat I have extra pens and I put an extra notebook for the story of the day. But with each minute there, I, I began to have a feeling that this man is, he, I, maybe what he's after I will not and I may not deliver. So he said, okay, uh, I've called you, I've read your column, you have good language, so I said that must be an endorsement or uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, some point of clearance that at least maybe I can write good English. <laughs> so I said, but he has pre-qualified me on that. Then, uh, shortly thereafter, he asked, me about, he asked me about jazz music, or jazz orchestra, the new I know. Of course, I, apart from having heard of Beethoven, uh, Mossad, I had no idea, even about any African who has played Mossad, I had no idea. It was not part of the life I led, uh, what we were reading, what we were consuming, and he would have asked me about orchestra Mangalapa, he would have asked me about uh, TV or the jazz, <laughs> but this one, uh, no. So I admitted, so he explained to me that he's a jazz enthusiast, 
it takes time once or every year to, to visit uh, international orchestras in UK or wherever, whichever country. And then he came to the point that he, he wanted to talk to somebody called Isaiah Katumwa. Have you heard about him? I said no. So he told me Isaiah Katumwa is the next bit of fame from Africa. He's the biggest sensation in jazz and he's coming to Kenya. Now, as he spoke, the distance between him and, uh, him and myself grew because the kind of life that you call ordinary village life and the sophistry and that exposure he's had was widening. Because every time he asks, I get the feeling he's so disappointed that I'm the wrong man to be asked these things. It was of obvious ignorance. <laughs> so, told me this young man, at that time I, I think he was the, the young man, he was a very young boy, uh, based in London. He had say, trained himself uh, in saxophone in, the, in Uganda, and he became a cessation, and then he was he taken to uh, for training in London. And so Jonjo told me, he's coming to play, to, to, he's hosting an orchestra at the Kenya National Theatre, and uh, that the reason why I've called you is, I want you to help me make jazz enthusiasts in Kenya to know that he's coming and come and, and then they will come and watch the performance at the Kenya National Theatre. So I said maybe this is the way to build my relationship with him because I'm beginning to feel that uh, I'm not going to get that what I wanted. You know my heart is sinking. So uh, uh, Jonjo uh, talks about this guy with a lot of uh, glorification, a lot of admiration, a lot of respect for a man of his age. And I, fe I felt him, I could understand because of his background and what he had told me. So, despite having told myself I'm not going to ask a lot of things when I'm with him, uh, let me ask, the, let me just hard on one fact. That as an editor with KTN and Standard, I could, and I will make sure that uh, we run the promo and tell Kenya this is coming. But go even further and go attend the performance and record and carry in subsequent bulletins and newspaper production. At that point, and I said we'll go there to the performance, there was a bit of silence, so-called silence in the room because in Georgia kept quiet. He looked at me, he clinked and looked at this table. Then he asked me, if I asked you to do that, I said, no, sir. Why would you want to do something I have not told you to do? I have made a very specific request to you. So I apologized and said, you know, I thought I'm being of help. So he, he appeared, I think that a bit disarmed him and said maybe again a confirmation this is the wrong guy to be dealing with. So he asked me whether, uh, again, uh, whether I've been to a jazz event. I said, no, sir. have you watched on TV? No. He said, no cameras are allowed in there. No movement is allowed, even if it's to take a break. Uh, you are not, uh, if you have a cough or flu, you, are, you stay off because you are going to disturb people, that you go and sit still and you demonstrate to me, when you sit, you sit still like a gentleman and watch the performance. Absorb every note, feel every string, feel every sound that comes. Appreciate and value. So do not tell me that you are going to let your people go there. They will not be allowed. So that ended my story with him. I, I felt I've lost what I was waiting for. So I looked around and for the, for once again I realized his office is empty. Uh, I don't see any computers, I don't see any, uh, uh, <laughs> any paperwork. So I said, I said bye and he told me we get in touch, go and do what you have, you have read. And uh, I'll pass this to your friend who referred me to you. I said yes sir. So I just said let me ask, the, let, can I, he asked me whether there's any question. I said I'll ask you one last question. At that time, I could not remind him that I thought this is a big story. I've lost up on that. So 
uh, because I realized if I take him back, he may go into that mood again. So I told him, uh, you know, I asked him, you know, uh, your office looks very, I mean, I don't see anything in your office to do the, with the, what you would find in the office. He asked like what? Say, I don't see paperwork. I don't see any computer. So he laughed and said, he scratched his head, you know, that, that hair. See, he laughed and laughed and said, I knew he had a very, very short laugh, but very powerful, but not, not you can almost meet it's not very audible. It was not, I mean, because maybe because of age, I didn't meet him when he was, he was strong. So he said, you know, why would I at my age have all those things featured with patterns of a machine, those toys, when I can have, pe I, when I have people that I pay to do that, they work for me. So I said, thank you, sir. And as I left, he shook my hand, which felt very nice. He escorted me to the door at his age. It is not his. That's another contradiction about this man. He's so humble, so simple, yet very firm, and a stickler of the tradition he grew up in. So he walked me <laughs> to the door, and as I left, I said, I truly belong to the group that are su supposed to work for him. Let me go and do my part in working for him. When I look at Njonjo, uh, I can actually, I think, break his life into three parts. Uh, there is the younger Njonjo who came from university, son of a chief, and uh, was very close to power, Kenyatta Mzee Kenyatta. Mzee Kenyatta was far, long, far older than him, but he was able to adjust despite, without, uh, one thing that never changed with him, all constant, was is respect and loyalty to the Anglican Church. Remember, the Anglican Church is an offshoot of the Church of England. And initially, because of its, its appendage or a brand, it was called the CPK, Church Province of Kenya. And it was very close to it. So no matter how far CPK changed and deviated towards uh, condemning anything that was from institutions of governance, and the religion that were inherited by Kenya from the colonial government, which Jonjo had very high respect for, especially the mannerisms and the style of life and the belief system. He remained a default member of the Anglican Church to the extent that we were being told he had his own pew, a place in, the, in front for himself. So I kept wondering at this stage then, how did Jonjo take the riots of uh, the, pro, 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 um, the, the push for the constitutional reforms and the riots that hung around Uru Park to the point that at one time, actually, tear gas was thrown into the church, uh, his church, where he waited, All Saints Cathedral. He, uh, Kina Kibaki was there, and a friend of Kibaki, the uh, former member of uh, parliament in Nyeri called Jok, Joka Mutani, uh, was was hit by a police by a policeman using a baton and he broke his arm. Njonjo was an object of uh, public discourse on a very unique life uh, that is as much as he's African and as much as we complain that all the our culture was diluted and we were made to do things that we were not uh, we were, we abandoned the good things. We are going to miss the person who stood for that contradiction, contradicting and, uh, life. For example, you find we don't complain about ourselves putting clothes, putting on clothes. And this is what came with the white man. But we complain about, say, uh, condemnation of polygamy. But Njonjo was able to bring all that, the new things together, and align that life to, without the apology. So I think it is more of public discourse. Of course, he had respect with his friends who felt that uh, uh, this is a true uh, uh, man in, the in, in, in that line. But above all, I think also in the world of business, I'm told he was a very, very, um, uh, very witty and intelligent businessman. Uh, I think the, we know the institutions that he's associated with, it. I think they were also missing. And then, uh, of course, the church will miss him because he was like the guiding um, hand behind the scenes in this issue of uh, institutional memory, 
an issue of uh, theology and uh, uh, ideology and the direction of thinking and uh, uh, how to navigate these changes that we are all dealing with, like uh, women of the nation in the charge. Uh, I mean, you can ask yourself, for example, if somebody was to talk about gay marriage in uh, Kenya, what the Junja would say, despite being a very hardened Anglican, he would say it never. Jonjo is one guy who decided that his story will never be put in right. So he has left us with the bigger task as Kenyans in eternity to always struggle and understand him. Because he's gone, he led the mythical life, he has died and left us to be, tell his story. Because you get people who tell you honestly, we tried uh, talking to Jonjo, I know some friends and he said, I have no story to tell, I have no story. And he has gone silently like that. So I think he has left a void in Kenya's uh, political discourse and even in the social arena. What did he really stand for? Because remember, all this discussion, there's not nobody saying, Georgia told me. Georgia gave this speech and said, it was only formal speeches. So we have a bigger task to, to weave together the Georgia story and let Kenyans decide what to believe about him. He was as much uh, a bad man to others as he was so good to others. Admired and some disliked him. Some felt he was aloof, some felt he was a genius. It's the story that has only started and it is a story that will continue. And it's upon historians and researchers in Kenya to try and bring out this unique character. For example, after suffering through uh, the humiliation of the Judicial uh, Commission of Inquiry, if you go to the footage on television, when President Moy lost his wife, Mama Lena, and he was lonely, grieving, the moment of agony, standing on the frontal, frontal, frontal steps of Kabarak University, waiting for the remains of his wife to be brought. I can tell you for about an hour, Moy was just there standing between two people. On the left was Mamangina Kenyatta and the son, the current president, Uru. On this other side was Njonjo and Moy's grandchildren. And you could see them playing with the old man. But that picture, the last picture, tells you the biggest statement of reconciliation that happened between these people towards the end. And I have, I've, heard from, uh, I've heard people discuss how, even in Moy's difficult days after presidency, Georgia was there for them. But they never discuss in public, and I think that's something that uh, was settled privately. And that's part of the stories that people will tell, the unique, uniqueness of Georgia. Thank you.